Hi, I'm Mimi Chan. Welcome to Culture Chat. Thanks for joining the conversation. Greg, Rucka, and I are back. We jump right into discussing the world on fire and the need for us to take care of one another and ourselves. Part of our self-care routine includes discussing Madeline Miller's novel, Circe. I was thrilled to discuss this novel with Greg and enjoyed his insights as a writer and one who has a lot more mythology knowledge than I do. Our next book club choice is Greg's very own Atticus Kodiak novels. We are reading Critical Space, Patriot Acts, and The Walking Dead. So we would love some listener questions for our future episodes, so start reading. For those that don't already know, Greg Rucka is a New York Times best-selling author of hundreds of comics and nearly two dozen novels. He's also the writer for the hit film The Old Guard starring Charlize Theron on Netflix now. I'm loving these conversations and hope you are too. If you are, please rate my podcast on your platform of choice and share it. If you'd like to help keep this podcast going and support with a donation, you can become a patron on the show on my website or patreon.com. For comments or suggestions, email me at mimi at culturechatpodcast.com or reach out on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan. Now on with the show. Hello, hello, Greg Rucka. <laughs> hello, how are you? Good. You are back from NYC. Yes, I am. And I am uh, in, uh, what is this? I got back Sunday mm-hmm. and today is Thursday. So what, five days of uh, isolation so far almost. And then tomorrow, they say the, the, the advice I've I've, I've been given is you wait five days after travel for the test Mm -hmm. um so uh, i will get swabbed tomorrow and uh we'll probably know the results early next week and then we'll probably end up in isolation for the rest anyway just to be on the safe side yeah i will warn you the swabbing is no joke it's no fun yeah no i figure they're gonna yeah, I have at least one friend who went through it, and it's like, yeah, you know, they're going to tickle your brain, and it's like, <laughs> all right, well, it's they're going to have to go in deep to find it. They but, do. Uh, it's a deep dive. I, you know, we went, and Oscar and I went together. We pull up to the little drive through and we're like, oh my god, this is like, this is for real, like dystopian future. There's the tents, people in their suits, and you know, they pull up. He, they do Oscar first, and his reaction was like they were, you know going right into his brain. I was like, oh my God, I'm next. And then of course he kind of maybe prepared me for it. So it wasn't as bad as I thought based on his reaction. He's totally going to be like, I can't believe you said this on air, but he did not like it. It was not cool. So yeah, very invasive. <laughs> well, okay. So now, now that we've terrified everybody who's listening, um, I cannot imagine speaking as somebody, we'll talk about it next time. I cannot imagine it is any more discomfort than any other um, sort of minor medical. You know, if, you, if you've had blood drawn, that's a discomfort. This is going to be a discomfort, right? Yeah, and, no, and, it's, and, it's not the worst and, thing ever. And it's exactly. five seconds. It's five yeah. seconds. It's, it's literally, it's literally yeah, it's going to be. They don't want it to take a long time either. So No, we'll no. And the teams are amazing. I mean, at least where we were, they were friendly. They were efficient. Yeah. I mean, they were working so hard. So it made the experience like much easier. Um, yeah. And the so, thing- yeah, it's just that it was kind of like, oh, you're going to hold it here for a few seconds. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the part I think that's I, jarring. I have to say, I think the thing that I'm finding far more problematic isn't the test itself. It's the fact that, before I, uh, uh, I went out to New York with Elliot, I had reached out to my primary care physician and I had talked to her basically saying, so this is, you know, I have to make this trip. We've got to do this travel. This is the way, and these, these are my plans. And, you know, she came back and she said, you know, it sounds to me like you're doing everything correctly and self-isolation is appropriate and what you should do. And then she ended the note by saying, unfortunately, because of, uh, the supply situation, we can't offer you a COVID test when we get back, when you get back. Oh. So my primary care physician can't get me a COVID test, but uh, the for-profit Zoom care chain here in town can. Hmm. Um, now, 
there's something wrong with that. Yeah, that's definitely You know what problem. I mean? Yeah. There's, some, there's something wrong with that. And, uh, and from there, we can extrapolate the entire problem with uh, the American healthcare system and its response to a global pandemic. Yeah, that's uh, so weird. We never talk about stuff like this. <laughs> look, I mean, how, you, you can't not. I, I, I just had a virtual coffee date with, with uh, Monsieur Ma- Matthew Fraction, who sends, who sends his best regards. Aww. You know, and we were talking about the fact that, uh, you know, I mean, this, look, the news, you know, it, it's unrelenting and it's not going to get better, guys. It's only going to get worse up to the election that this is this is an all-out assault mm-hmm. on every single thing that can have a bearing on the outcome of the election so it's going to be propaganda noise all the time it's going to be disaster all the time it's going to be doom and gloom all the time and it's going to be very difficult I think for anybody who was remotely engaged or concerned to not, th- there's going to be difficulty in maintaining the necessary self care. Um, and, and yeah, look, we talk about this stuff all the time, but the reason we talk about it all the time is because it's happening all the time. <laughs> if it stopped happening, we wouldn't talk about it. Right. Yeah. I mean, exactly. seriously, if, if, <laughs> If, if the Republic wasn't teetering on the brink of ultimate collapse, if, you know, the rise of fascism wasn't, you know, a, a, a nearly unimpeded thing, if the overreach of the executive wasn't beyond control, if, you know, the, 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 the House and the Senate weren't, you know, uh, facilitating this but rather doing their jobs we would be we would have other things to talk we'd be able to go like oh hey you talked to gina it sounds like that went great i can't wait to hear that podcast (laughs) mimi but the fact of the matter is that you know in the immortal words you know of of the movie full metal jacket you know it's a great big shit sandwich and we're all gonna have to take a bite and (laughs) so it, it is a we we do need to, we you know, the positives here are the positives that we have to make for ourselves. And I think one of the things, and clearly I've had a lot of time to think, you know, because <laughs> I'm in self-isolation. But I really do think that, it, and we've said this over and over again, and I know that you and Oscar, you know, are practice it, certainly with regards to, um, to fitness, um, but yeah, we, we need to be taking care of ourselves and each other because, man, there is a sucking vortex of misery. And like I say, it, it, it's not going to get better. Um, this is just going to get keep ramping up yeah. until, until we hit the breaking point. And then it's either going to break one way or the other. Um, but until we hit that breaking point, this is not going to stop. So guess what, guys? You know, it's what, 98 days to the election as we record this. Buckle up. Because <laughs> if you yeah. thought the last three, you know, three plus years have been bad, hey, you ain't seen it. It literally is, you know, the, the gag of 2020 saying, oh, yeah, hold my beer. You know? <laughs> um, no, this I, I literally, and like you said, Oscar and I really – have to actually work at it. People think, oh, you guys are into, you know, wellness and fitness and you meditate. I'm like, it's active work because I yeah. literally have anxiety thinking about November. Like yeah. my stomach gets tight. I have anxiety. I think about what happened to me after the 2016 election and I can't go there again. And I have to prepare myself in a different way. And uh, honestly, you know, these conversations are super helpful, of course. And I know other listeners have said the same thing. Like it feels like we're in this in this hamster wheel. But the thing is, like you said, the hamster wheel won't end. And so of course we're going to talk about it. Of course we're going to address it. We're going to bring these things to light and we're not going to sugarcoat it because it's important (laughs) that people hear. And, and, and and germane to that, 
and I think this is important to remember as well, is that it's intentional. Um, the, the White House doesn't want it then. They, they want this to continue. The, the tactic has always been to overwhelm and to distract, right? Yeah. Um, so here's a legitimate issue, quick, you know, and, and I read a quote, Oh, God, I can't even remember what it was. It literally Trump saying it was when they it was when they were looking into Ivanka as one of you know Ivanka's shady dealings, and he was like, "Oh, I'll, I'll distract from it." There is a deliberate culture of distraction, and <clears throat> that is not to say that um, that is not to say that he is not a racist, sexist motherfucker. It is to <laughs> say that he is a con artist and he works very hard on going look at the shiny thing over here yeah so the reason that we feel so besieged is because we are besieged it's yeah. not fake right it is we're not imagining it we're not making it up it's this is a real thing so it you know my my and it's a common enough phrase my my my, my father may rest in peace he used to say keep your powder dry right keep your powder dry um and we got to keep our powder dry, you know, there, because there's always something else to be outraged about. Um, so it becomes a question of going, well, where, where do you want your outrage today? See if you can get through the day without spending any, right? Yeah. It, it, literally, because there, I guarantee you, there will be more opportunities to spend it. <laughs> so maybe, you know, just saying, you know what? Today I'm not checking Instagram. Today I'm not, I'm not reading the news. Mm -hmm. Today is the day where instead of you know television, it's a book, and it's okay to take that day, right? Yeah. It, it, it's not okay to disengage entirely. Right. Yeah. You can't just check out because it's still going right. to be there, and you'll have to come back eventually, and then you'll be <laughs> right. But but it's. I would argue not only healthy, but uh, a necessity to say, yeah, but you, you deserve, you deserve a day off mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they don't want you to have one. That's why the onslaught keeps coming. Exactly. So, so you've got to, you've got to mandate it. You've got to say, no, no, I am today. I am yeah. today is tonight is pizza night and my favorite movie, you know what I mean? Or, or whatnot. And, and you take it from there. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's something you and I certainly talk about a lot is that self-care and this being part of that process. But I think it's so easy to forget. And, you know, one of the things that Oscar often discuss with his clients who are always coming in just anxious because they literally, they just watch the news or heard the news. And he's like, you know, they go, how come you don't let it get to you? How come you're so mm -hmm. Zen? Cause he's the Zen one of the two of us. And, um, He's like, it's not that I don't get bothered. It's just that I have this thing where as soon as I'm getting bothered, immediately my response is, okay, that's bothering me. And I don't, like, you kind of have to acknowledge it and just say, all right, I'm giving this a minute of my time and that's it. Or I'm going to give this the five minutes. I'll go hit a bag. Or, like, you have to kind of acknowledge it and then allow mm -hmm. and decide how much power it's going to have, right? How much, how much time it's going to take from you. And when you, when you think about time being our most precious commodity, you're like, I don't want to give it that much time. And this is all easier said than done, of course, listeners, but it's kind of a thing. Like you have to figure out what your triggers are and you have to kind of go, okay, how am I going to acknowledge this? What am I going to do? Come up with a plan. Um, and, and, and believe you me, I have to come up with lots of different plans because it, it's like a daily thing on what that's going to be. But mm -hmm. um, you did mention reading. And of course, that's one of the things. That yeah, I was going to say, do. we're doing Circe. <laughs> we, we, we're talking Circe today, aren't we? We are. And, and I literally just remembered that. And I was like, oh man, I better like, I, I was like, quick, open the iPad and remember <laughs> character names. Um, because, oh boy. I, uh, <laughs> and it's funny, it didn't finish it that long ago. Right, but it feels yet, like so much is in your brain since then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it literally is, oh, I have lost so much. Uh, yes, so yes, yeah, no, I'm so excited. And I'm excited to discuss Cersei with you. And we have a slew of uh, listener and my book club questions <laughs> that have, have come up. Not that, um, you know, you're this uh, Cersei expert or whatnot, but obviously yeah, no. you, you know a <laughs> lot more about Greek mythology than we do. And you're a writer, so I, I, don't, I don't. use you as my source <laughs> okay don't do not do not 
do not remotely put me in these like okay so to use the Circe analogy if if uh if madeline miller is uh is a titan i'm i'm just a feeble mortal here <laughs> like the orders of magnitude of difference in mastery oh yeah well we is, we do know she is uh the the queen of uh at this point she teaches mythology she she does oh, yeah and she's fluent in, in, she's fluent she's in all the language in, in latin and, 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 she, and in greek and she yes, clearly she's interpreted a lot of the the yeah. doctrines and and everything so obviously obviously so but as a writer as someone who has had to research mythology i you're 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 the titan and i'm the mere mortal here so oh, it's stop. all it's all to scale you know but i also just thought it would be a fun thing for us to discuss and give listeners a little bit of that break although unfortunately some of these questions are going to lead us back down the uh the path that we often tread on but um but yeah did you enjoy the read yeah no i thought it was uh lovely i um i have not read song of achilles yet and i am not certain no i'm not certain i want to what? um i'm just i'm not it, it's i think it may be a gender thing um <laughs> I'm not really that interested in the Achilles of it all. Uh, I was far more, I was far more taken with, um, uh, with the Circe of it. Um, well, I will say it's less about Achilles and more about the Patroclus, which, yeah, I, I, you know, and I, I know. Read, and, 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 and I'm, I, 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 I am, uh, I, I, I may well get to it when I right, get to but the it's not on the of top, other things. It's not on the top of the list. Yeah, but I am a, I, I, I was, um, yeah, because uh, I hadn't read any Miller before, um, before Circe, and I loved it. I just mm -hmm. thought it was terrific. Nicola had um, listened to it, I think, over a year or so ago, mm -hmm. and she had raved about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you and know, you it's always, why. <laughs> and it's always a good sign. When I come out of a, a novel going, ooh, I could, you know, or this, you could, you could do that. And well, that was that. Things. That was one of the questions that came <clears> up. <throat> was like, well, um, so if Rucka had this as source material, what kind of story would he come up with? And you know, so people were kind of interested. That's not a quick. That's not a quick answer. I know, that but like, a... but basically, it does spark things in your mind when you read. Oh something. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think that the the. Um, the I think. So when, when an author writes in first person, everything they are doing is character. Um, and lesser authors do not realize this or do not embrace it. And really good authors or authors who are capable of being really good acknowledge that in the choice of a first person narrator, everything that follows is on the basis of that narration, right? Because the narrator is the character in the story, how they choose to describe what they choose to describe is entirely, uh, that that's their character, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I thought Miller just did a masterful job. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting to approach a, um, to, to approach these very traditional and in particular the, the Homerian aspects of the myth. Mm -hmm. And, um, and frankly, to postmodern them, you know, to, to, to to give Odysseus PTSD. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I love her portrayal of Odysseus because, you know, growing up, you read the Odyssey and, mm -hmm. and he's the hero. Mm -hmm. He is, you know, he's just shown in one light, like the shiny penny. And I love in both Song of Achilles and Circe, like, it's like, oh, there's another side. Never thought about it, really. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. I thought, I think that's what's also really interesting about her portrayals of things. And yeah. like, just say, no, yeah. let's take this character and make it, you know, about her and how she's a heroine and why. Well, and, 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 and that, I mean, otherwise you don't have a novel, you know, right. I mean, it's, it's like, it, it clearly, you know, I mean, Miller's premise is that, and I, I would imagine if, if you and I were to able 
to sit down with her and interview her. And I haven't, I'm sure there are interviews out there. I haven't read any of them, mm-hmm. but I suspect, I would not be surprised if you said to her, well, so where does the idea start? You know, and if it is in her going, well, you know, I was looking at the Odyssey and there's, you know, it's really given, you know, the, and I, and I don't, you know, it was a long time ago that I read the Odyssey. Yeah, it's, it's you know, been a looking while. at the ratio of time spent on the Odysseus Circe relationship versus Odysseus and Calypso, or right. whatnot. Um, and then you know this process, like because I remember always the reading about. Um, I, I was always in that myth, um, taken by uh, Penelope, and 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 I was always curious about. Her. Um, I was always very, very curious about what it would have been like to have spent 10 years with squatters in your fucking house. (laughs) Yeah, I know. (laughs) Trying to raise your little boy and navigating that every day. And, you know, so I can see where those kernels are. Um, And then the clear, you know, just scholarly expertise that Miller brings to it that then allows her to go, all right, well, let's take a, let's look at Pacify a little more closely. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I, I just, so yeah, I, I, I found it, um, found it very moving. Um, I am not certain a hundred percent what I think of the ending. Um, I think it's beautifully written. Mm-hmm. I think I think the, the 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 resolution is a beautiful ending and a beautiful possibility. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a little piece of me that goes, it's kind of cheap. It's kind of cop out. <laughs> okay, and uh, like expand on that. And and just um, for our listeners, she does have some really great interviews. One of them is on Ezra Klein, and I, mm-hmm. I highly recommend that uh, listeners who are interested in this book check that one out. Like she really does divulge a lot of really great insight to why she picks certain characters, her favorites, and a little more about the, the you know her information and where 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 she kind of gets a, a lot of her her uh, inspiration and everything. So, but so expand a little bit about. Okay, so it's beautiful because she's basically no, I mean, it's, it's, spoiler it, it, alert, it, everyone. <laughs> um, but oh, come, well, hang on, wait a minute. If you got this far, yeah, you've read it. <laughs> in the one, in the one where we said we're going to talk about this book, and you don't want to hear us discussing it, but now is the time to get off this train. But <laughs> but it, we're assuming buyer beware. No you know. one, no one ever stops listening to us. It's the <laughs> Mimi and Greg show. <laughs> yeah. We're living in our own, uh, our heads. No, but um, basically, you know, like she, she, you know, sit, about to sip the cup. And so we presume then she gets to be mortal because of her witchery, because she never wanted to be a god. And, and then she gets that little happy ending that she kind of imagines right before, or, or is it left up to the reader? To really well, know? maybe not. Oh, it's enti- it's entirely left up to the reader. I mean, that, that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's one of the things about the ending is, is that, it becomes entirely subjective. I am about to do this thing. And it's important to remember, it's not going to quote unquote, make her mortal. Mm-hmm. It's going to make her what she truly is. Ah, right, right, right. The mo- right? The, um, I mean, what, what, the moly what, flowers is, yeah. Well, it, 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 it's, it's the same, um, it's the same blood of the Titan flowers that were used to make Scylla and to make um, Glaucus into a god, right? right it's right. that it, it reveals the truth. You become your true self. Right. So that was actually also a listener question that wanted kind of a little more of your thoughts on that, whether it was literally, is that your true form or what your wish or um, how that influences like the interpretation of the ending then, right? Because it's like what we don't, like what is like we know what she wishes. So like you said, then that means maybe she doesn't become mortal because her true form may be, maybe it's just a witch. (laughs) Well, well, it's not your, and again, I mean, this, this might require a closer read and I would have to go back through, but my memory is right. That 
the nature of that spell is it it reveals your true the, self the truth of you mm -hmm. so for Scylla um if if it is the true self and not the true desire mm -hmm. then um then Scylla is unrepentantly vile and horrible um and 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 hence becomes the form of that mm -hmm. because that form is is so vile as to be without reason right mm -hmm. in each encounter that Circe has with Scylla after Scylla is transformed yeah um Scylla's ability to perceive or to cogitate to to understand is clearly arrested by the hunger and the hatred driving her, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and I mean, and that's a hell of a statement. If what you're saying is that Scylla the Nymph was always this monster. Right. Then, um, then that's saying that Scylla had absolutely, not only no redeeming qualities, but in fact, only malevolent qualities. Right. Versus, say, Glaucus, who becomes this god of the oceans, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's harder to read him for me. Like, that was always within him. So what was always within him? The arrogance, the entitlement. Mm -hmm. right the the behavior um you know he he becomes a god and immediately you know goes and gets payback on dad and yeah and everyone accepts him and oh yeah he's yeah, like no popular <laughs> i was like the poor cersei <laughs> no i mean i don't i don't have a whole lot of sympathy for cersei in it right um, well i just not, not in that i mean right it, it is it is exactly the kind of mistake one makes when one has fallen in love for the first time. Um, <laughs> and because technically, like, we see her as a, in our minds as an adult, but, like, in terms of her God life, like, that's her little teen years, right? Like, that's her juvenile yeah. years. Yeah, because as she says, she has never really been out. You know, she doesn't become who she is until she's exiled. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know... You know, I, I, and, and maybe that's the maybe that's the brilliance of the ending, is that you have to walk away from it. Each reader walks away from it if they want to invest the time and the thought into it, uh, having to decide who Cersei truly is, because that's what she becomes, mm -hmm. right? Um, it is not simply a spell that is going to grant her, is going to abandon her divinity and grant her immortal life. Hence the conditional language. The conditional language is these things could be what happens. There could be these daughters. There could be this long life with uh, Telemachus. There could be this dying of old age and going to the sticks and, you know, going to the, the, the land of the shades and so on. Could be. Um, I don't know what I think of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, and it may simply be that me being who I am and where my interests and fascinations are in, 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 in what I've been writing the last several years, uh, I am more intrigued uh, I think by the Circe who persists. Mm -hmm. um, there's another interesting question that that is just worth considering, perhaps, which is that when and I say this as an author, right, as a guy who has written prose and written prose in first person, when you sit down and you are writing in first person one of the things you have to acknowledge is the conceit of the act of the writing, right? 
the narrator is telling you they're talking to you, right? The, uh, the narrator has written these words. The, the author disappears. There is no Madeline Miller. Circe wrote this book for you to read. Why? Right? The question is why? Why does Circe want to tell you this story? Why, why is Circe at all concerned with sharing it. The book is not constructed as a discovered journal. She addresses the reader more than once. She acknowledges that the book is being read. Um, and if I remember correctly, she uses the phrases like even now in the book, like as she's writing, she says even now. Mm -hmm. When is that now? <laughs> right when is that now is that now was it after she got everything she wanted and became right. Little? right or is it or is it three years ago in a manhattan apartment mm -hmm. you know and it begs other questions too which is the book like I say, and look, I ask specific questions because of the nature of what I do. Yeah, and this and is my, why I wanted to talk to you about it. I'm like, oh, that's a great question, Greg. <laughs> but the the book, the, the, nothing in the book is um, how to put this. There is nothing subjective in the world of the book. The world of the book is accepted and is fact. Um, Helios is Halls, uh, all of the gods, all of the titans, all of the nymphs, right? All of the myth. All of it is taken as true. It is presented as true. You don't look at it at any point and go, oh, she's making it up or she's lying. These are all factual truths. Mm -hmm. Which then begs the question about the persistence of the Titans and the Olympians and so on when you're reading it in 2020. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting inflection point, right? Mm -hmm. It just becomes a very interesting question. Because um, I'm not sure, at least on one read, who Circe truly holy is. So... There is a piece of me that goes, but she is, she has become who she truly is. And if that potion will grant you your wish, then absolutely what she describes is pretty much the ending she gets. But if the potion only reveals who you are, um, then she is Circe. Mm -hmm. And has become Circe. The whole purpose of the novel is the journey of her becoming and accepting that. Right. Right? Yeah. Um, which, which doesn't necessarily mean it's a sad ending. It just means that the ending... Uh, this is now we're going to jump to comics. It's one of the reasons why I hate how people misinterpret the killing joke. This is one of the reasons why I hate the character of the Red Hood. All right? Okay. Um, the killing joke is a lie and the Joker says it is a lie, but somewhere along the line, somebody in comics said, no, this is the origin of the Joker. It's not. It is not the origin of the Joker. He says it is not my origin. Right. I'm just making it up. All right. So. You know, but by, but by the same token, then, the ending that Miller offers is one way it could end, not the way it did end. Right. And there is a question as to whether or not it has ever ended. 
Right. Uh, like, but when you brought that up, like, well, she could be writing or s- telling the story from her Manhattan apartment. Like, I was mm-hmm. like, oh, I had never yeah. even thought of that. You know why? Because as a, a, a listener or reader who is just like, okay, I'm going to enjoy this story and then I'm going to want it to end the way I yeah. want it to end. That's kind of what you end up taking away. But I do love asking these questions and having these, you know, kind of thoughts because it does make you see books on a different level. And that's well, why. It's and, and I would talk to you. One, one goes, you know, I would, I mean, given, given Circe's journey and given the empathy and sympathy I have for her, I would love for her to have a happy ending. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not sure gods get happy endings. Right. Right. And she is a God. So then the question becomes, could she stop being a god? And the answer to that is, again, subjective. Because I'm not sure. um, I'm not sure it, for me, I buy Circe wishing she was human Mm -hmm. as much as wishing she could be amongst them more. Um, so anyway, uh, that, that was, <laughs> well, that was that, 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 like I say, you, we can chase that one for a while. Right. I and assume but, there are other questions. There are other <laughs> questions. I mean, and one of the things I, I, you know, on a, on a, the, the main, you know, thematic things that have been brought up, like in the book clubs and things like that is that, you know, humans are the ones who are truly living And gods aren't, they're the ones who are without life, right? So Mm -hmm. because they, and that's maybe why they're so meddlesome in our lives and whatnot, but like, it's an interesting thing. And that's how she keeps, like you just said, she wants to be among them because Mm -hmm. it's that feeling, right? Like humans have this life and though they die, it had meant something. And so in in, in ways like you kind of think about that, everyone's like, oh, I want to be a god or old guard. I want to be immortal. But then it's not all it's cracked up to be. Um, And I think Cersei kind of shows more of that that side. Whereas, you know, in the past, you just see, oh, you know, they're just throwing lightning bolts at us. And they're- Well, except except the other thing, the thing that marks her as different, right? The reason the significance of the meeting with Prometheus is what it is, Mm -hmm. is that- um, she is the only divinity we meet aside from Prometheus who has that relationship with mortals, right? Um, she's the only one who, who, who basically is looking at the table from the other side. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, for all the other gods, they don't have a problem with this relationship. They, they don't have any problem with it at all. They, they, not one of them complains about it once. Nowhere in the book does another divine character outside of Prometheus indicate anything like genuine sympathy or empathy with these humans, right? The moral is in it, right? And, it's, and, and the, the reference of... Um, you know, and Odysseus being the great example of it, you know, that, um, you know, you, you, you grant the mortal your favor, you grant the mortal your favor, and then you abandon them. <laughs> and then they'll come crawling back wanting even more, right? And um, that's all of them, yeah. right? And that's even, that's, that's even, the, that's even the, the nymphs' relationships, you know, that's the problem with Scylla and, Glo- uh, and Glaucus. Mm-hmm. Right, I am. I am. I'm going to keep getting bigger and bigger pearls from this guy. Right, he's going to give me more and give me more and give me more. It's all. It's all. Every relationship is transactional. Yeah, and it's understood to be transactional. Um, and you know, and and Circe's relationship, and again Prometheus's relationship, um are not transactional. Right. So yeah, and that was uh somebody asked kind of like in what way you thought her meeting with Prometheus or that whole interaction, how that if that changed her or in what way did that truly like set her on her path or impact her? That was that was just like one of the listeners. Well, I mean it's interesting that I, I think 
the, the primary thing we get out of it is guess, guess what? She's got empathy. Nobody else does. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the second is that it, you know, dramatically sets stakes, right? She knows what happens if you go against the rules. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I would imagine that part of the significance of that meeting is to further, if, if it doesn't awaken in her this curiosity about the morals, right? It certainly reinforces it. Mm -hmm. Because the question is, why would you do this for them? Right? Why would you do this for them? You yeah. are suffering horribly and eternally. And this is another thing I would- And you, you knew know. you were going to suffer exactly. horribly and eternally. It was faded or here he knew, yeah. And, and, and bear that, bearing that in mind, look at the ending again and ask yourself if you think Circe gets an out when Prometheus is still having his livery. You know, mm -hmm. did, did she find a way to slip the trap? Can you slip? <laughs> can you slip that trap? Right, right. Oh, well, they set you up because she, you know, has, has her one off with Helios, and it's like, oh yeah, she could stand up to them. But you're right. Uh, up to what point do they go? Well, wait. You don't or, get your yeah. Or you're not worth it. Not, or yeah. you know, I mean, there are some spiteful gods up there. Oh, yeah. Well, one um, of the listener questions slash comments was the gods, like our president, are shallow, vain and petty. And yet Greeks still worshipped them, even though they all up in, in, end up in Hades and there's no magical heaven for the dead. So it's this kind of weird worship of something that actually doesn't have this, you know, magical ending. So it's kind of a weird thing. <laughs> well, this, it, it's interesting that my, my understanding of... Um, of sort of ancient Greek religion and ancient Greek culture. Mm -hmm. it, your average Athenian didn't wander through, you know, the Agora, and th there were these statues, they were called Herms, right? And there were, you know, there were little statues of Hermes with these big erections. Um, and no, in all sincerity. And yeah. um, they didn't, you know, you didn't go up to the, to the you know the Parthenon or whatnot and 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 um the, how to put this to imply that they were less sophisticated than us in their interpretation of religion and religious belief is potentially mistaken that they understood that what you know that that in as much as you prayed to Athena they weren't actually expecting Athena to show up. Athena represented certain things. Mm -hmm. So that when there were stories and there were myths, right? These weren't, th nowhere is there a myth that says, I, Perseus, went out and did this, and Athena showed up and said, go kill Medusa. So I went and I killed Medusa, <laughs> right? That's not how that myth is told, right? right? They, they're always told at a remove. These are stories that, and, it, and this is why, if you think about it, the, the gods are these all-powerful, incredibly flawed creatures because they're all cautionary, right? Mm -hmm. They are all cautionary stories. They're all stories about, we don't do that. You don't, <laughs> you don't do this. You don't act like that. That's not how a society should function. Right? And, 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 and sometimes, bad things happen to good people, i.e. Ariadne, right? Mm -hmm. um, what happened then? Demeter just was having a bad day. Or was it Artemis? It's like Artemis was just I pissed. think it was Artemis, yeah. Yeah, Artemis was just cranky that day. And, <laughs> and you're like, the hell? <laughs> right? I mean, well, guess what? Kind of, you know, now abstract that and we go, yeah, shit happens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, trying to apply some reason to it. Uh, you know, what is what is <clears throat> what is religion except in an attempt to justify to uh, to explain why things are the way they are, mm -hmm. and and this is regardless of faith, which is a different thing, right? Right. And and to and to codify behaviors that allow a society to function healthily. 
right? I mean, this is why this is why Jesus is a winner, right? Because <laughs> if you actually are paying attention to what the lessons are, right, you can't look at those lessons and go, "Oh man, I disagree with that." That doesn't right. make the world should a not place. be good to your Exa- neighbor. Right? That's exactly it. You can't yeah. you yeah. can't look at anything Jesus taught and go, "Well, that leads to a worse society." It doesn't. Right, right. It's it's the people who then twist it for their own purposes. Yes. Who who do it? But but the root of it is, you know, uh, the meek shall inherit the earth. You know, be kind to others. Mm-hmm. Right. Get, get, turn the other cheek. Mm-hmm. Be gracious. Be charitable. You know, be empathetic. Yeah. Be loving. Oh, well, okay. Okay, this would that would be great. Let's do it. <laughs> right? Let's do it. I just love that you said this is why Jesus is a winner. <laughs> That's perfect. But you know what's weird? It's but, Oscar but, and I literally today we're just talking about this because someone brought up, oh, you know, this the, the basketball player, the one that didn't kneel, it's because he did it for his religion. And I respect that. And Oscar's like, well, but doesn't, you know, we we had this discussion and I go, well, but doesn't one who like a religion that dictates that you can or can't do something that has a moral and ethical compass that might be a good thing. Like there's that, 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 like you said, they're yeah. using it as a weapon or using it yeah. to control people. Uh, That's the issue, which is the whole faith versus religion thing. Right? I, I would, I would absolutely, absolutely question the logic behind going, oh, I'm only going to kneel for my faith. It's like, okay. All right, great, great. I I think that you misunderstand why you're kneeling, but that's all right. You know, it's the same bullshit that whatever his name was in the UK was saying about, oh, you know, it's a sign of subjugation. It's like, dude, you watched way too much Game of Thrones. <laughs> Take it, bend the knee. <laughs> that's exactly it. I mean, that and that was exactly his argument. It's like, well, in Game of Thrones, it's, just, it's like, you know, <laughs> people forget or ignore yeah. the fact that, you know, when Kaepernick took the knee, that wasn't something he did on a whim. And it wasn't something he did uh, without incredible consideration and research. I mean, he is on record as saying, I, sp- I went to veterans. What is the respectful thing to do here? Mm-hmm that would be the the right way to protest. And was told, kneeling, right? So if the argument is, well, I only only bow to God or whatnot, then how can you say kneeling to the flag, taking a knee to the flag to say, I want this to be better. I, I believe our country can be better. How is that disrespectful? I don't know. I mean, it, it, the, the, the <laughs> amount of intellectual calisthenics that are required <laughs> yeah. to say that kneeling is somehow disrespectful um, is, is an extraordinary effort. Well, that's the point. There's no intellectual calisthenics. It's blindly following and listening, I think is what happens there, yeah. <laughs> which so. you and I know. All right. So another question was in American mythology, how many of our leaders are weaker than we were taught? So kind of how, you know, we see the gods and we're, we're, we see them very differently. So basically history has shown us one thing and there's this fight for, of course, in education now to have quote unquote, the real stories or real mm-hmm. history. Um, so of course, like Washington and Lincoln, there's all these amazing things they did, but then they're also yeah. not so amazing things. Um, no, they, 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 they were human. Mm-hmm. Um, this is incidentally the, the, the problem with cancel culture, um, <laughs> which is it, it allows for no sin. Um, it does not allow for the complexity of life. Um, I did and said things when I was in my teens and 20s that I am not proud of. If I was only to be judged by the asshole I was at 18. Um, oh, yeah. We've, and you we've know what I mean? talked about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, so we look, I mean, you know, you cannot deny that, you know, Thomas Jefferson was 
uh, arguably a genius, certainly brilliant, was a gifted writer, was a great thinker, was an architect, right? Was a very talented man. He was a slave owner mm -hmm. who, you know, who coerced sex from his from his slaves, from, from people whose freedom he had taken, right? Um, these are not, we, we, we shouldn't, I think it's a mistake to try to reconcile them, right? It, because in reconciling them, there is, I think, a, 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 an implication that there should be forgiveness. And it shouldn't be forgiven. Yeah. But at the same time, the complexity should not be ignored. Right? The positive should not be ignored. And, and, and it goes the other way around, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I am told, I, I am told, I, I recall reading that, um, you know, there have been members of the civil rights movement who uh, were perhaps not so mindful of their marriage vows. Does that mean that their message shouldn't be remembered and that their sacrifices shouldn't be honored? Um, I, I'm, I, and, and, and here's the thing, and, and I know, you know, this is where we get into, this is where we start to skate out on, on some potentially thin ice. Because I think it's very important to acknowledge the sins. I think we have to also find a way to um, hold the paradox of what it is to be human. Um, you know, my, uh, I was. Uh, uh, I, I, I saw my daughter yesterday from 15 feet away. Um, we were running lines and I forget what it was, but somehow Hemingway came up in conversation and she said something like, you know, blah, 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 sexist. And uh, yes, he is. Absolutely. Also a brilliant writer. Um, his sexism should not prevent people from reading the work. Yeah, it's right? um, we. I, I have a discussion all the time with a friend of mine, Dan John. We we do the the dissection of uh, the Sword and the Stone, and one of his mm -hmm. favorite things is that historian um, with Stanley, which is like nothing is more unfair to judge men of the past by the ideas of the present. So we've learned all these things now mm -hmm. like i mean other than the obvious this is wrong etc but i mean we're given certain information and we're privy to things now that you know words verbiage things you know, this guy said this in the, in this book right. and you know like things have changed over time but, and and we do need to acknowledge that but the, it, and and again like i say this is where the ice gets thin mm -hmm. that doesn't excuse the sins of yeah. a jefferson Mm -hmm. or a Washington, and you cannot, and you will never be able to convince me that there was a slave owner in this country who did not, on some level, know that what they were doing was absolutely and fundamentally a crime against humanity. Right. It wasn't like, well, everyone's doing it, so it should, it must that be may, okay. Yeah, that, that may have been the justification. And there may yeah, have been but some but like you said, deep down you know when you're yeah. when you're doing something and, right or wrong. And, and there and there had to be some where it was at the front of their brain, and it had to be some where they were they were tamping it way the hell down. But you cannot tell me that Jefferson writes a a, a, a declaration of independence and is not aware that he is omitting two thirds of the population, you know, in this document, that women and slaves, and, and, and you know, they, these are not citizens, these are not, you, you can't tell me that that didn't ping for him. And like I say, I don't think, I, I think it's really important. 
we can turn in the modern moment today and we can look and say, we, we can look to people who are seeking forgiveness and we can, with a whole heart and, and with a degree of, I think, fairness, sort of evaluate their attempts to make right and decide whether or not we are willing to grant it. I think for history, it's not an issue of forgiveness. We don't, and we should not look and be like, oh, you were forgiven for these things. Yeah. They, they can't be. Yeah. Yeah. What they need to be, what they need to be done is redressed, right? That, that those sins that perpetuate have to be redressed. But you don't look at Jefferson and go, well, we can forgive you because, hey, Declaration of Independence. Right, right. Yeah. Not you're then, right. Not reconciling it is important exactly. Thing. You, you, instead, you've got to look at it and be like, "Yeah, dude, you were great in a lot of ways, and you were horrible." Mm-hmm. And and we cannot tell the story of the great without the horrible anymore. Right. We and that's to, we have to tell both. Yeah, I think that's what's been missing. Right. Yes. That's definitely what's been missing. So another part of Cersei that was a huge fun topic of discussion was um, basically where she goes to the serpent under the sea to get the dragon's tail. And, Uh, you know, she was willing to suffer and, you know, that's kind of like Excalibur. It's kind of like all these things, are you worthy? But, um, and this is, this is totally from Oscar, but he's like, basically like motherhood is rough. (laughs) Like he was just like, you know, lengths you will go through for your children or fatherhood or however. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it's just um, what you'd be willing to do, but also that whole, that whole um, journey was kind of a nice little like a little escape from even I felt like from rest of the book it was just this little mm-hmm. fun um little journey that we got and uh it's just that was like a it was, that was always a fun topic for everybody to talk about well and again it's 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 one of the moments of of the story that marks her so it's what makes Circe again so special right is that she is willing she understands the pain and is willing to accept it which is something that no, I mean, her brother wouldn't do it. And we right. know that her brother is only about power. Mm-hmm. So faced with the ultimate power, he was unwilling. Right. Yeah. That her, her willingness to do so on to defend, uh, what was it? Telemachus. Telema- uh, Telemachus. Yeah. It's- Telemachus. Telemachus is the Penelope's. I know. Yeah. She uh, Miller talks about why she did that as well in that podcast. And of course, I don't remember the exact. I'm yeah, not yeah. going to try to articulate well, they it. Mean, yeah, they, they, mean, they mean similar things. Yes. Uh, yes. But yes. Um, yeah. I assume she created uh, the offspring child. That that child is not uh, in any of the myths. Uh, I don't know. Telemachus, Telemachus is. Is, yes, yeah. But I don't recall, and again, like I am 30 years, 35 years out from right. being, being agile with this stuff. Back from <laughs> the days when I was reading the Odyssey in, in, in the original Greek and going, I don't understand this. <laughs> um, well, I've never even seen it, so you're a lot further along than I am. But um, sp- Yeah. No, it's the say? same being someone that has kind of, you know, when you've had different arcs and things come up, you do your research, like, were there things during the book uh, that you're like, oh, this was a nice little sprinkle or something kind of different with other oh God, yeah. mythology stories that kind of jumped out at you that you enjoyed? Yeah, I, I, well, and I loved, I loved all the, I loved the, um, uh, everything on Minos, mm-hmm. uh, uh and uh, I loved actually Daedalus. Okay. Um, I, I was really, um, he's always been a mythological favorite. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, and I thought it was an interesting angle on Icarus um, because Icarus is always presented as a myth about pride. Mm-hmm, because uh, it blew too close. Yeah, he, that's quite it. You fl- you f- the, the the moral of the the Icarus myth is right. If you fly if you fly too high, you will be burned. Mm-hmm. Right. You, that 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 Apollo 
is insulted that he comes so close to the sun and so melts the wings, right? Mm -hmm. That it's a punishment. And that as Miller presents it, it is this exuberance of freedom. Yeah, escaping. It, it is not a malice per se, though it is a, um, it, I mean, it's recast to fill Circe's narrative, right? Which is that, mm -hmm. that empathy, that knowledge that the mortals die, that this stuff is lost, that the grief is real. Um, and I really thought the, um, I, you know, I mean, look, there, there, were, there were takes in there all throughout that I thought were a, were a hoot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to me, the book doesn't really, it doesn't really, for me, come fully alive until she's in exile for obvious reasons, because she doesn't right. become fully alive until she's in exile. Um, Yeah, I, I I mean, it's very hard. I, I there's really like I say, I, there's a lot of book that I have problems with. It's a book that I have questions about. Which is good. <laughs> like which I want to know more. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. just fun too. It's like kind of like why the island of Ayaya and why is that so special and mm -hmm. and then why did Penelope like just take to it and just basically thrive there and well, but. See, that's again, that's Miller. That's right. Miller writing. That why the she's ending. choosing to, to right. make that Penelope she, have a li life there. And <laughs> well, and she gave Penelope this thing, right? Yeah. She, this yeah. is, she gets this to be is, the witch. <laughs> yeah, and well, and, and Penelope gets a reward, yeah. right? Penelope gets a happiness. Mm -hmm. Penelope gets a solitude. Penelope gets everything that was denied her waiting for 10 years for her husband to return and instead back comes this very sick and broken man, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so. Yeah. All right. Final question is mm. um, a slash comment from a, a listener, you know, is Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> if our president took the moly flower, he wouldn't change at all. Cause he already looks like a bloated Cheeto colored monster. <laughs> But what do you think he would turn into, Greg? <laughs> uh, that's just catnip for you. <laughs> um, yeah, he turned into Scylla. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, you know, the descriptions of Scylla are very telling, right? There's nothing noble in, 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 in Scylla. Scylla is a... Vile, very vile, horrible, oh. nasty monster, right? I mean, is is disgusting, is rapacious, is evil, right? Versus, say, the Minotaur, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Who is this crazed, bestial thing, but can be calmed, mm -hmm. and that you know, Ariadne immediately is this. That's my brother, right? That, that there is a connection there. Mm -hmm. There's no connection with Scylla, right? The only, the only thing that binds Scylla to any humanity is Circe, and it's Circe's guilt, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, if, if, you were, if you were to reveal the, the true Trump form, you know, it, 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 it is uh, a rapacious creature driven only by selfish desire. I mean, that's... That's it. <laughs> Pretty right? simple. That's it. That, yeah, that's it. It's just, it's, 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 it, it is, you know, it, it's a two year old on an eternal temper tantrum. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, we'll pick that up next week. <laughs> oh, yes. In um, the sequel. Yeah. But uh, as always, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And I missed you last week. Well, I'm glad we got the catch up. Of course, it's always lovely. So uh, so thank you, listeners, for all your questions. And uh, hopefully the Circe conversation was stimulating. And yes. I love that you had so many questions. And I'm really glad you enjoyed the book. Uh, I also, loved it. And I were thinking our next book kind of thing, um, selfishly, we could do sort of more of a, a Kodiak uh, character thing because I'm mm. like you know reading Critical Space and he's already done Walking Dead. And then we're both going to attack, uh, I think, is it Patriarch? Patriot Acts. Patriot Acts. It, Patriot Acts. Patriot Acts. it goes. It goes. 
It goes critical space, Patriot Acts, Walking Dead. Right. So once I get that one, I was like, maybe we'll invite him on since he's the only one that can read Walking Dead because I can't (laughs) touch that subject. But then, you know, we could kind of pick your brain about it and talk to you about that. And listeners then can start listening to Kodiak and reading Kodiak in the meantime. But we could do that down down the road and we'll just kind of announce that now officially so you guys can start picking the ones that you like and submitting questions about this lovely character. And since you kind of know a little about it. I do know a little bit. I, I have a some bit. knowledge there. You have some yeah. knowledge. That now you are the Titan. <laughs> yes. That one I can speak to with some authority. <laughs> you are the Titan. So um, as always, Greg, thank you so much for joining my culture Thank chat. you, Mimi. And oh, thanks everybody pleasure. for listening. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Until next week. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening to Culture Chat. and hope you enjoyed the conversation. Please subscribe and rate my podcast. Feel free to leave me suggestions or send an email to Mimi at culturechatpodcast.com or follow me on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook.